Genetic potential, the defining source of an athlete's talent and performance. What is it and how do we go about understanding it, tending to it, and ultimately unleashing it? We want to really get to the bottom of what we're seeing in the world. We are running drills, we're testing ideas, putting theories down. Of these are the essential questions to be asked and answered on the Genetic Potential Show. Hey, welcome to Genetic Potential TV, the first ever episode. My name is Kelly Starrett. I'm here with... Brian McKenzie, how are you? Uh, Genetic Potential TV is an idea, honestly, kind of cooked up originally in your garage, right? You yes. started this, you, had, you did a few shows with your buddy, Doug. Dougie. Dougie, 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 Dougie Fresh. Dougie Fresh. And you were talking about kind of the issues of the day in running endurance athletes. Yep. Um, you moved up to San Rafael, so you live five doors down from me. Just in full disclosure, Brian lives exactly five doors down from me. Cross street, five doors down. So we skate back and forth. So one of the things that happened to us is that we were spending a lot of time in the same room, kind of nattering back and forth about what we were seeing in the world, the tweets we were seeing, the, the, the internets, the, the, the athletes we were working with, and what we thought was, boy, we can expand this conversation into a much larger audience that we could kind of talk about behind the scenes. And some of the pieces I think that are missing for the average coach, the average athlete, some of the aspects of, you know, where does the rubber hit the road? How, you know, the, the, the behind the scenes story, besides the formal strength conditioning piece. And we thought, let's do, have a TV show about it. Exactly. It's exactly. Who are you? What are you capable of doing genetically? Genetically. So genetically. this show is a little <laughs> bit about taking out the slack, talking about the, the concepts of the day, what we're seeing. Um, some background, I think, which is nice for people to understand. I mean, most people who are going to watch the show know who you are. Yeah. Um, I uh, have a clinical doctor in physical therapy. Classically so trained. Classically trained. Whoa. Shing. Whoa. Right, so I have this background, but uh, where the rubber hits the road, we're in San Francisco CrossFit, um, which is my, my lab and now your lab, where yes. we are running drills, we're testing ideas, putting theories down, and really working out the kinks because there's sort of in my head, one of the interesting things about this TV show is in the world of strength and conditioning, we say, okay, we, if you're a power lifter, it makes sense. You're a sport, you can train there, you can figure out how that works. Um, if you're an Olympic lifter, you can, you know, you're working out with Diane Fu in the corner, you know, that all happens within the gym. Those are kind of gym related sports. Yeah. But the real interesting thing is how do we and can we affect the genetic potential or the capacities of people in sports that aren't driven by this? So right now you, you've got your hands deep into the pulse of endurance sports. You've just come out with your book, Power Speed Endurance, yes, right? Sir. So Clearly you've got a feeling there, but what's interesting is that you kind of take all of these nutritional aspects, all the learning, all the things you develop from kind of Formula One athlete, athletics, and now you're working with surfers, you're about to go down and work maybe with the men's national, men's national team rowing, yes. right? Uh, what we want to do is we want to talk about um, the sort of exposure that we're having. We're, I have my hands on everything. Ev everything. <laughs> I'm just, you know, trying, trying to be messy and dirty. And somebody just finished a book, didn't he? I did, on he Friday. Did did he turn this? He turned this in. Turned it in. Are, are you elevate? Are you floating right I am. now? Three hundred ninety one pages. Ten Aww. ten thousand. Uh, what do we do? Add forty uh, four thousand photos in there. What you're going to be able to do with this book is um, actually just put it onto your injured site. Yes. And and, uh, and it'll cure your that's cancer. Right. It'll cure your shoulder cancer. That's the that's the dream. I, uh, I I've witnessed this entire thing uh, pretty much living down the street, and it has been one hellacious project. Uh, and I thought what I was doing was a hellacious project, and not to undermine my own project, but uh, it. it uh, <coughs> Ke Kelly has, quite frankly, not only, in my opinion, changed sports medicine, but revolutionizing sports medicine. And this book is going to do just put a stamp on that entire thing. What I think we have a chance to do with this show is talk about the issues of the day, um, talk about the, the nitty gritty, the meat of the practice that we're doing in our kind of strength conditioning community, in, in our experience. And then we're going to be able to pull in we know some extraordinary athletes. Yes. We know extraordinary coaches, and we want to put them in front of you guys so that you can talk about how they're solving problems in real time. You know, in the background, we've got one of the fittest women on the planet, Julie Fouché, working Who? with, oh, second, uh -huh. second in CrossFit Games. Oh, yeah. uh, working with Carl Powley back there. We have uh, Diane Fu, Uber Olympic lifter. Um, Jess, Jesse Burdick, Mark Bell, two of our good friends, right yep. now are at uh, um, the Arnold. 
<laughs> and uh, what, what's happened is we've gotten exposure and we have so many friends who are solving the same sets of problems over and over. And, but because we live in a time where we all can be connected, we're having conversations and being able to really pull out the slack of the basic problems of the athletic human condition. You know, between, you know, Mobility Wad and uh, the, you know, CrossFit Endurance, mm -hmm. we're able to tell a lot of stories, but we can't really tell the big, big stories that we want to talk about. Yeah, I agree. So let's do that. So let's, let's go ahead and break into, for example, um, one of the things that's been happening with me is I have been getting a lot of tweets and a lot of talk about the NFL Combine that we've been seeing. Yeah. I am not a sprint running coach, yeah. but I am a strength and conditioning coach who works with a lot of other coaches. And one of the things that happened is a kid just ran, what, a 427? 427. Unbelievable. And one of the con conversations that I think is, that sets up this, this show is this notion of can you coach speed? You know, you know, people are like, hey, speed is not coachable in the NFL. Is that true? I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I, I, I am of the mind that uh, there are many things that you could do for something like a 40 in setting that up and, and being, you know, properly trained or, you know, ha having the ability to actually run better mechanically. Ah, oh, and now we're getting Whoa. into it. So I think one of the things that we want to talk about, and I, one of the things that I'm really proud of, the, the supple legion out there, yeah. um, is that people are taking pictures of inefficient positions and being able to start to see a shift in consciousness about good shape, bad shape, knees coming in, uh, loss of position, person is overextended. What we want to kind of be able to talk about is, you know, what are the pieces that sort of aggregate, because maybe I can't change my absolute genetic potential, but how do I maximize my genetic potential? Yeah, well, you know, and you, you touch on a good point, is so these, we're seeing these positions and all these pictures are coming through of these positions these guys are in. And it's like, we, a, a lot of people have caught on to what a bad position looks like versus a good position. Optimal and, position. O optimal, correct. And these guys are still monsters, right? right? now, I'm, I'm in a fairly optimal position. and. As I slouch back and try to get a little bit more comfortable from sitting on the plane ride, I'm in a less optimal position. And yet, and yet you could still be the best in the world. And this is, this is really yes. the heart and soul of this thing. So one of our, one of our keys, I think, that, that ties this together is we saw RG3 yes. have a horrific injury on his knee. Yeah. And um, there was a Subway commercial that you captured an image of. Yeah. What happened during that Subway commercial? Well, they, Subway labeled his 49 and a half inch vertical. I think it was 39.5. 39.5. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, my bad. Uh, so 39.5, right? Vertical jump. Which is pretty insane. Which is insane. And that position is in a valgus knee position. He jumps from this position. And so we, here we have a human being who is a extraordinary athlete. The best in the could potentially be one of the best quarterbacks that's ever existed. Does that mean he can improve? Does that mean he can't improve? And with what we understand, with what I understand, and what you understand, we believe, yes, there can be improvement. And we can improve that position. So I hope to bring on some coaches in the next, you know, because I mean, clearly that guy stood up, practiced what he'd practice, practice turned the foot out, and then, uh, you know. Pull back into a snap. Knee valgus again, knee in this very unprotected position, which you talk about all the time with that ACL unwinding. Pop, there it goes. And my, I mean, my biggest uh, thing is that I, you know, I'm like, I look at something like that and I'm like, dude, that sucks. But dude, that's so avoidable, the my deal. friend. So that how, is so avoidable. How are we going to take out this this genetic slack? How can we talk about those pieces? I want to, I want to talk to, you know, you know. Wellborn plays plays football in the NFL for ten years. How does he solve this problem? Well, yeah. you know, what what is he coaching? Um, one of the you know the the things that's been popping up from from some other friends is that Lady Gaga just tore her hip. She just tore like tore labrum in her hip. She had to cancel her tour. Now this is a big deal for me because you know obviously I love Lady Gaga and her meat dress. Yes, you do. Comma uh, that was a thirty million dollar tour. So she she loses. She has to cancel her tour for hip. A Rod, same hip. They, in fact, there was a New York Times article where they they show up in the same surgeon's office. He's out. I mean, what's the what's the cost to our athletic kind of group from just making bad movement habits? Maybe maybe you know how do you manage travel? How do you manage being sleep deprived? 
you know, how do you, that's, that's where we want to go. That's a conversation I, you know, Aaron and I had uh, just this last week traveling to Columbia. Okay, There's so let's, let's, no let, way. let's set this up here. So what we want to do is uh, for this next piece, what we're going to do is we're going to bring on Aaron Cafaro. Um, we want to talk about now, Aaron Cafaro is a two-time Olympic medalist. Two-time. Is that a gold medalist? In fact, I'm pretty Three-time sure she, world champion. she has medaled in every World Cup and every World Champion she's ever competed in. Yes. She's a two-time national champion, too, so that, yes. that's sort of a big deal. Aaron really is sort of the epitome of this, this, this notion of genetic potential, is that how can we take raw will, right, which is this un, unquantifiable pace, like no one can out-suffer that girl, no one can out-compete yeah. that girl, yeah. probably the best athlete I've ever met, and then couple that with good practices where she's allowed to express how great she can become. And I think Aaron is actually the first, one of the first athletes I've seen who's actually cracked into the 90s about what's possible. Yeah. You know, low yeah. 90s, but yeah. still 90s. Which means she, she gets 90% of, uh, of the benefit of the back. So yeah. we're gonna use Aaron as a test case as an example of this concept of genetic potential yes. and where we can go. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. That's 90 percentile of... Of Aaron. Of Aaron, of, of, of athletic potential. That's right. Right? So. Uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna set up. We're gonna go move to the to the erg. Um, I think that this um, this show has legs. I think we have a chance to really show what the conversations we're having about adaptation, recovery, nutrition, how we're solving the problems of the day. Uh, I think we got enough people involved who are excited about helping our athletes and coaches out in the world who are working hard. But get behind the scenes a little bit more. Don't, don't tell me how many times you front squat a week, but tell me how you solve being tired off an airplane and, uh, and go yeah. from there. We've yeah. got, we got, we got Sage coming on. Our girls at the San Jose State uh, that we've been working with are at the WAC Championships right now. We've we'll got their coach on, who's doing one of the best jobs of integrating Division I sports into a strength and conditioning program, into nutrition. There's nobody who's doing a better job right now within the, within the collegiate world in managing not only a strength and conditioning program, but a program itself that has what? Zero injuries this year? Oh, weird. We mean the entire team? swimming team that has no shoulder injuries? No shoulder injuries. And is, uh, for the first time in their history, ranked in the top 25. Shing. All right, so here we go. We're, we're, we're going to take a quick pause. We're going to set up. We'll bring Aaron back, and we'll see you guys in a second. Boom. OK, guys, if you want to get a hold of us, you want to get more involved, here's how you're going to do it. Hit us on Facebook. Send us your best picture of the worst thing you're seeing during the week. Twitter, at GP Television. Hashtag Leopard Fail. Hashtag I See More Potential. And then of course, hashtag GPTV. Appropriate that uh, Aaron Cafaro is our first guest Freak. on the inaugural episode, yeah, Genetic Monster herself. Um, there's something I should just put to rest. Aaron Cafaro is not my sister. Even though on the internet, <sighs> Into the even it's on the statement. Olympic official bio, I'm listed as her as her brother. She's the closest thing I have to a sister. So in full disclosure, I'm obviously a huge fan. And uh, you know, we started working together five years ago. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we wanted to bring Erin on today was just to talk about her experiences, most importantly. Um, and, but just because she was the perfect test case for what we thought was here's an athlete who's working really hard, who has a genetically gifted athletic background. A history of good competitions, a fierce competitor. How much slack can we get? I think uh, if the people out there who are CrossFitters could understand that, uh, I think on hungover on New Year's Day, you did like a 400 fight gone bad on your first go, which is a, just a you know, you were like, what's what's a push that press? My, that was in my wheelhouse. Yeah, you're like, what's my push <laughs> press? You know, so the idea is that just basic walking in, giant, big big engine. So. Brian McKenzie became friends through Aaron, with Aaron. You guys started collaborating on some things, and then... Be uh, you. Collaborating. Collaborating. <laughs> and then, uh, what, ha what happened in that relationship? You guys talking about that? He was doing a running seminar, and I showed up. I was actually injured at the time, um, and I was broken. I was broken, so I came down there to... Oh. Yeah, broke, as a joke. Um, and I came down there to, you know, learn how to find more potential and, and uh, stay healthy. I, we were introduced via Kelly and the, we, we began a, a relationship about three years ago in communicating and talking about training and kind of picked up a lot of that slack and Aaron and I then this last year became very close and are now together but the point of what we're talking about is that in this last year leading into the cycle we actually took even the pieces that Kelly and Aaron had put together 
and we applied them to an in-place training program so that we didn't have the same issues that Erin had seen, not only in her last Olympic cycle, but in quite a few of her other training cycles, where she was running into problems with getting literally broken ribs, um, things like that. Um, and we, not, we dialed in her nutrition and we focused on these positions and these things that we talk about and we implemented it into a huge, huge program. Can you, can you talk about that? Because I think mm -hmm. one of the things that we're, right now we're still s struggling with as a community a little bit at large, so in the addition community, is how do you, you know, you have to do what the national team is asking you to do. You have to do what right. your strength and conditioning team is asking you to do. How does a modern strength and conditioning program work into an Olympic cycle? How does, that, how does that work? How did you kind of fit some of these other concepts of strength and conditioning into what you had to do as an athlete for the national team? Right. Well, first and foremost, you're part of a team. You aren't any better than anybody else on your team. And I, I chose boats where I had a teammate. I was never by myself. And so you have to cultivate that relationship with your teammates and not only work on bringing yourself up, but make sure everybody around you is being brought up as well. And so we would be assigned, you know, you know, our programming would all be the same. We would be rowing with each other in the boat. Um, we would be lifting with each other. Everything was the same. And it's hard because we aren't all made the same. Like I was about mm, six inches, five inches shorter than everybody else. So my weaknesses were a lot different than everybody else's. Um, so the way that I adjusted and kind of found more potential for myself in the sport was, you know, with rowing, there's two things. There's distance and there's power. I can't do anything about the distance, right, because I can't grow anymore. So I had to work on my power, and that's what you helped me with. So how would you do that? What's that look like? Um, so, because what we're really talking about is you had to go row, what, five or six days a week? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Probably seven days a week. Yeah. You were doing something. How how do you fit that in? What what specifically? What does that look like? It was it was a little bit of trial and error for sure. Um, There's you know some years where I maybe did too much. I added in too much. I supplemented a little <laughs> too much. Um, but so it was trial and error. But uh, yeah, no, I think first I just wanted to add this power. You know, I wanted to be stronger. But then as the years went on, as as it became closer and closer to the 2012 Olympics. Um, I noticed that moving well and being smarter about you know position and movement was much more important than power because power is position. So I would TM uh, by the way. Whoa, Circle whoa, C. Whoa. That's right. <laughs> Compliments of yeah. Might have uh, put that in my head Love over it. and over so and over again. Just gives us background, like what's your best two K time? So people can realize what we're talking about in terms of wattage. Um, output. Time. Six thirty nine was my last one. 352 watt average. She averages 352 watts. For six minutes and 39 Whoa. seconds. Okay, yeah. so that's, uh, that makes me a little queasy. Um, I think I love is that I'm a rower. I do some rowing on the yeah. rowing machine, You're a great right? Rower. Yeah. And uh, when I think about rowing a 500 and working on that, mm -hmm. I think about having to try to pull like 145 as a split. Mm -hmm. And can you just throw us out there? <laughs> this is my favorite statistic of Aaron. She always gives me grief. You talk about that my your last six K test. What were you averaging for your last six K test? It was like one forty four point seven, I believe. One forty four. So just as a reference, six K. What, what we're really looking at is <laughs> the the positions and efficiency that aggregate over you know six kilometers. How long does that take? Uh, that was uh, twenty fifty eight. Twenty minutes. Yeah. Twenty almost twenty one minutes of output. Yeah. So. Um, I just got a question uh, from one of my athletes who is training hard, she's training hard for the games coming mm -hmm. up here, and she's like, I don't feel like I'm eating enough. Was this a problem for you? Because I mean, hmm. it seems like the nutrition aspect is one of the big pieces that certainly I didn't have a good hold on, or I'm, I'm always been bringing in friends. How do you manage that? Yeah, it has to work in with your training, um, and especially, you know, there's always an optimal weight, but with injury that's off you know you aren't recovering well enough or your your position is wrong first of all but you also need to look at your recovery so it has to be your nutrition and that's where Brian really stepped in and helped me um, preparing my meals chef Boyardee <laughs> but um you, 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 know. you guys but you guys some specific things with the no. macronutrients oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Can you talk about that no yeah and I think that's important especially even with female oh, athletes yeah. yeah is you know um 
it's not that Aaron, Aaron understands clean eating, understands how to eat healthy, yeah. all of that. And that's not that, like, that was not what I walked I was, into. I was eating paleo. We, wa we walked into a very, very optimal situation, but what we, what, where, where things start to go wrong is where athletes don't understand macronutrient ratios and what, what should happen. And for the most part, what most people understand in programs is we need more carbohydrate sources. And it's not that we avoid carbohydrate sources. At all. But mm -hmm. No, no, you don't need to, but you don't need to up them to, to high, high levels. In fact, upping them to high, high levels will can, and can cause many, many issues. But what we can do is we, is we can bring those fat levels up higher because that fat becomes a buffer. And this was the main thing we saw with Aaron. And this is, this is a very typical thing we see with female athletes. And even when they're training at this level and this high, and one of the biggest signs you see is like menstruation cycles. They just don't even get them. They're almost void of fat in their diet. And because they're afraid of it or getting bigger or doing something and it's like look you're not understanding the concept of fat and how fat actually works mm -hmm. and how it can buffer this the, the whole system you know that that fat buffers that nervous system for when you are training that hard with that much yeah. you get into this this cycle where you need to buffer that nervous system one of the things that i saw i think right after you'd won world championship mm -hmm. and you back you said american history by winning the first ever Paris medal you literally, like someone was like high-fiving you and one of the younger kids was handing you like a meal replacement shake and a banana. And you're like, woo, we just said American history. And you're already thinking about the next thing. Is that, with that piece of, piece of advice, is that that nutrition aspect of this is as important as the training piece for you? Yeah, and I, you know, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because I've even evolved from there. I'm constantly looking for information and the newest studies and what's, you know, been being published out there and now before it was always about post recovery um, or post workout recovery um, and now what we've found out is it's actually pre-workout if you don't even don't let yourself get to that depth you know you don't want to go into a workout or training fasting because it'll be harder for you to boost back yeah, up. This is what most of the studies were done that were showing post-workout nutrition is that they were actually done in fasted states. So you are, of course, going to make a huge gain yeah. afterwards. But if you're not in that fasted state, they're just not seeing. So it's all about that pre-setup. So yeah, yeah, that's interesting that you brought that up about 2009 and you know here we are 2013. And yeah, I don't, I don't really do much post-workout recovery anymore. It's all about pre making sure that I'm fueled and ready for the workout. You know. But nutrition is number one. That, that was the piece this, that you this felt is the like foundation that really where, allowed you to work as hard as you could. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And no. she's uh, eating uh, at, like, that, at that level. It's not about it's not about who's going the hardest or who's you know the most talented. It's about who can recover. It's yeah. a recovery game. And let me just lay out. Let me just lay out like what a day looked like. Like because I was there. I was cooking. I mean, she would go to practice at six o'clock in the morning, and come back at about eight and there would be a meal, and she would eat that meal. She would then go to sleep. <laughs> was, that, was that a big piece? Did you, I mean, did, did you, did you think yeah. that that's an error that a lot of people were making? That, I think it's, it's all about recovery, and a lot of, even on my team, there were some girls who tried to do other things and you know, balance out their life, but if you wanna be at the top, I mean, you have to eat, sleep, and play your sport. There's, there's no time, um, I mean, like you have to recover your head, you have to be in the right space mentally before every practice, you have to be in the right space physically. And um, for me, napping was where I, you know, and sleeping and getting about 14 hours of sleep a day, was it? Something it was, like it was insane. Something retarded like that. I mean, that's what it was. It was, yeah. it was train, eat, sleep, train, eat, sleep, train, eat, sleep. You know, you basically are, of all the aerobic machines I've seen, you have one of the biggest, hottest aerobic engines ever, right? So hot. Diesel. The diesel. I mean, I've gotten, I've got my hands on some Tour de France guys. They're, they have big lungs too. Yeah, they're skinny though. What's, what's in store for you? What, what does this look like? They are skinny. It's true. Um, what's the next piece? You know, I, I feel like I've been fortunate enough to be around so many good coaches, and you know, come up and have coaches help me, and then watch you guys go out and change people's lives and I feel like I need to help and do the same thing. I've, you know, accumulated all this information and now I need to help give it out, but I don't know, it's hard. I, I'm just a competitive little bugger. I can't, we'll <laughs> so see I, where that goes. I heard, I heard you're doing some running, right? 
Did a little bit of running. Did a little running. Now you're actually you're, doing, you're still doing some coaching. You're coaching at your college, coaching a little lo local school. How do yeah. people find out more about you or, or, or uh, find your info or reach out to you? How cool um, AaronCafaro.com um, or let's see, Twitter handle is your name. It's my name, yeah, Aaron Cafaro. This is At my Aaron. social media manager. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think the, yeah. the reason I'm point is that you know you run a lot of these experiments for us. You, know, you solve the the issue of fat, and that means that when we're when we're looking with our swimmers or people, in, yeah. you know, we're able to talk about up because that's that's what we want to show is we want to show that these experiments have been run. You figured out how to sort of optimize your genetic potential, and now you know. I shouldn't have to run that experiment again because I can just put apply that to a world. Yeah, yeah, I'm around. San Francisco CrossFit, baby. There it is. Whoa. Aaron Jane Cafaro. Good Thanks, to know bro. you. All right, so what we want to do now is talk about uh, a section that we've been excited about because we get so many questions. I don't know how many emails you get asking for explicit advice, and it usually starts with this. Life stories? <laughs> Kelly, I know you're really busy, but... Wasn't there a time that we compared, I think, weekly? We, we did. We, we would talk. That's right. We'd send them back. Hey, can you beat this one? So here's what we want to do. We want to do in the mail, um, questions we had via Twitter, photos we've, we've talked about. Um, we could also call this leopard fail because our uh, the people out there are seeing some awesome things. So when we start getting awesome photos, we'll start to aggregate those things. Yeah, let's send, have people send those into the, into the, fa the GPTV, uh, Facebook, and even Twitter feeds. Just right. toss them at you us. You got a question and, you want us to talk about in real time, we're going we're gonna to go behind the scenes and, and talk about it in unadulterated terms. So first one we want to talk about is we got this image of that shoe. That sketchy, sketchy sketchers. Shoe. Now, that, if I'm wrong, is that is, that shoe is a, is rocked, right? Con convex, bro. Convex. Yes. Not concave. Not concave. Okay, so from a physical therapist's point of view, let's just let's make it a couple things right. Yes. When you're born, yes. Is your heel on the ground? Yes, no. Yes. Okay. So, anytime your heel's not on the ground, you're walking or standing. That's sort of a problem. Could be. Okay. So your foot is sort of a miracle of dynamic motion, it, it's, it should be flexible and soft and then all of a sudden become rigid and firm, it should be able to support 1,300 pounds and yet feel, what's up with that shoe? How so many, I mean, you're a runner, how many, right? How many bones are in the human foot? All of them. Oh yeah. How many, ligaments? All, all of, of them. them. So <laughs> when we look at that system as yeah. a complex fascial, neuromuscular, structural piece made of tendons, ligaments, bony, bony pieces, skin supports the system. And all of a sudden, we try to mitigate or attenuate what's supposed to actually happen to that foot. Because what they're, what they're doing with that shoe is literally walking in a rigid foot and just ri hinging, using instead of the foot or ankle as motion, is just trying, trying to rock through that motion. They're gonna do, it's going to do the work for you, right? Going to build your butt. It's true that if you have the right shoe, you can run faster. Oh, yeah. If you have the right shoe, you can lift more weights. That's right. That's right. Okay, so it's not that I'm, we're anti-shoe and you should be no. barefoot all the time. No. But all of what we're saying, though, is if you're cruising around in that, what you're doing is fundamentally altering the biomechanics of the entire system. You're wrecking your heels. And the key for people to understand is I think people are in that shoe, moms and dads. So I think that came from an athlete who was saying, hey, what do you think about this? My mom asked me a question about it. If it gives me less pain, is that better? No. 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 We're not addressing the problem. One of my, and I think what's one of the things we want to talk about and take on in the show is uh, something Carl Pally says. Just because something is harder doesn't mean it's not better. And the, this concept is that, like, look, it's hard work to be a human being. You're going to have to do some maintenance. You're going to have to make sure that you're optimizing your sleep, your nutrition, your hydration, your work output. You're going to have to integrate that with travel and stress and all these things. How do we take that slack up? That is a Band-Aid, a stinking Band-Aid, and that is the worst application. That is just uh, a disaster. I, so, could, I, I, I could not agree more. And, and you know, the fact is, is what we see a lot of elderly people in these things who bought into this hook, line, sinker idea, and this is why we need to get this information out there, is we need people to understand that this is not a good idea, and this is not right. going and, to help. And them. it leads us to the, the next question in the mailbag, which is about you know high rep box jumps. We um, we're going to see this uh, kind of portrayed in our sport. People are worried about the, some of the, the mechanics jumping down. Yeah. Clearly, I have witnessed people jump up and down from the dawn of time. Even I did it in like high school, jumping down off the bleachers for thousands, tens of thousands of reps. 
and yet I don't get injured. I didn't, I didn't wreck myself. So what happened? What, why is it that sometimes we see people jump down and blow their Achilles, or sometimes they play basketball and blow their Achilles, or you know, sprint and blow out a uh, heel cord? What's going on Th with that? This is definitely more up your arena, but at first I didn't necessarily agree with you. Uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, I was like, dude, bro. Everybody should be box jumping, repetition, just repping it out, you know, rebounding off the and ball. You were using that to actually as a training stimulus for running. But, yeah, but and that's what I didn't understand what, what I was doing. But then when I really grasped the concept of what it was that I was doing and what it was my athletes were doing, hell, we were all runners. We were all running a lot and we had developed this ability to do this and we weren't seeing any of the problems that sure. everybody else was seeing out there where, hey, maybe I'm out here Olympic weightlifting or I'm in, a, I'm in a lifting bias program and oh yeah, I'm gonna decide to do some rebounding box jumps later today for the first time in a few weeks. Hmm, wonder if that's gonna be a problem if I've been in a shoe that's taking dorsiflexion out, an Olympic weightlifting shoe, then right. getting into a shoe that's lower or low, I'm more closer to that zero differential point, and I decide to start blowing out box jumps. This is where we start to run into problems. So it goes beyond, is this a safe movement, yes, no, because I can make the case that just about any movement performed poorly is not safe, right? That is the biggest thing that people are gonna need to realize, and this is what we're really truly bringing to this show, is that the fact is, is anything you do poorly is wrong. It can, can 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 be a problem. Now, one of one of the screens I I'm hammering people on wherever I go, and especially my courses and in the world is, can you do a pistol? Yeah. Can you? And I don't mean you, can you squat down to a pistol. Can you get into the bottom position of a pistol? Because if you can, chances are you have enough ankle range of motion to be able to absorb that full load and have the knee translate forward for your jump at least without collapsing, right? Much less now we can start talking about the tissue, and then are you strong enough to withstand that? Yeah. You know, and I, I just had somebody on Twitter who was uh, an endurance athlete saying, hey, every time I go do rebounding box jumps, I'm feeling pain here. Is this a problem? Yes, that's a problem. Um, and that is something you need to get fixed prior to going and doing things like this. I think we could probably do a two-hour show just simply talking about all of the, the crazy MRIs, the crazy videos, the, the questions we get. And uh, so please keep them coming. Yeah, hit us on Facebook, on Twitter, send all that stuff in so that we can really start to accumulate all the good stuff and bring that to light here so that it makes sense. And uh, please send us your best picture of the worst thing you're seeing during the week. We will... Uh, let's, hashtag, let's hashtag that I see more potential. I see more potential. I see more potential. Or hashtag leopard fail. I, I, I said I see potential, I see more potential. I see more potential. I see more potential, hashtag, or hashtag leopard fail. Uh, we'll choose a photo every week when we do the show, and we'll send you uh, something awesome. Very awesome. So, something private and awesome. And I think this could be uh, the beginning of something very beautiful. Yes, it could. It could be very beautiful. Check us out, <laughs> geneticpotentialtv.com. You just uh, come up with that stuff, don't you? Shame. We will see you guys next week.